Mr. Eric Barker, welcome again to the Wolf and Iron Podcast. Great to have you back, man. It's great to be here, buddy. So we were kind of joking a little bit beforehand. Um, you guys who are listening to this on audio can't see the video, but if you're on YouTube, obviously you can see this. Uh, Eric's a stellar job of uh, soundproofing his, his background there. Because I know people are going to watch the video and they're going to go, what is that? What is happening there? Like, we're all a work in progress, people, okay? You know? Yes. Yes. I like I, absolutely. These four panels are, that's all you need, man. That's all. That's all. That's all you need. <laughs> I can't wait. I'll have you on next year or whenever you finish the next book again. It'll and then five. it'll be totally done. It'll be five panels. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to add one per year. One per year. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, very cool, man. Well, we've got a new book out, and uh, I had you on the podcast uh, sometime back for your, your other book, uh, Barking Up the Wrong Tree, which I really loved. And a lot of this comes down to just how you write as, a, as an author. You've got a very much a just you're hanging out with a cool dude and you're having a conversation sort of vibe about uh, – I can't believe I used the word vibe – uh, you've got a, you've got an approach. I need to think of a better word. You got you got a way of writing that is is not intimidating. It's very inviting, and uh, and at the same time, uh, we're learning a lot of stuff that's uh, is deep. You know, deep subjects, and a lot of research has been done. And you know, here with your new book, uh, which I got in front of me, plays well with others. The same approach, and I very much liked it. And I've got a lot of questions for you. Um, but for the guys who maybe didn't check out the first interview back in the day. Uh, give us some insight into who you are, what you do, and maybe why you decided to tackle this subject. Yeah, um, I, I basically, I've had a blog for 13 years now writing about uh, scientific research to try and get answers on how to live a better life. And my first book, basically, I looked at all the maxims of success that we grow up with. Nice guys finish last. It's not mm -hmm. what you know, it's who you know. And figured, and tried to do Mythbusters, stress test them, and figure out, are these true? Are they not true? What, what do we really need to know going forward? And so that was pretty cool, studying success. And then I looked at relationships because I think most relationship books, especially I think a lot of guys don't relate to them. I think we, I, I think it's something that, you know, the genre hasn't always been honest. It hasn't yeah. always been straightforward, kind of tells you what you want to hear. And so I decided to test some of the maxims there. You know, it's like, does love conquer all? Is a friend in need a friend indeed? You know, those kind of maxims. And frankly, I've never been really good with relationships. I'm not great with keeping up with people. I'm not always easy to get along with. So for me, it was a personal journey. And literally, literally, like a month after I closed the deal for, uh, for my book, the pandemic hit. Oh, and yeah. I knew a lot of people were going to be dealing with loneliness, relationships are going to be strained. And so all of a sudden I became a man on a mission because I was like, I'm not the only person who's going to need this book. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. And I, I've been in the same position. I, I grew up uh, spending a lot of time by myself. I was raised by my grandparents for a good bit of time out in the country in Tennessee. And I had like maybe like one friend that would come around during the summertime and, um, you know, kids at school and stuff like that. But I was never much of a uh, oh, I want to go to the birthday party, or I want to go be part of the thing, or I want to go socialize. I was very much an introvert, even from a young age. And that kind of served me well living alone uh, up until the point when I got married. And now like relationships important. And then we start having kids and like relationships with my kids are important. And then I'm leading things in, you know, at the job and now with our own businesses and stuff like that. And so these relational dynamics really just started to become more and more important. And I realized that I, I'm really not great at them. And so you, I, I think for guys that are like us, we do tend to kind of think, well, what are the things that I've heard about relationships? You know, what are the things that I think probably work, should work in terms of relationships, which is great with your book here, because you, you outline, like you said, a lot of those things and kind of walk through those, uh, to kind of prove them out, uh, not prove them out or, um, uh, to give us examples and stuff, you know, of, of, of them being lived out or in, in various ways. And I've got, a, I've got a comment on your, um, your storytelling ability. Cause like you said, a lot of relationship books are just like, they're not geared for guys because yeah. guys love stories. Whereas most relationship books are, I don't know if they're written for women or they're just from a different perspective. And it's all about just emotions and the drama and the dynamics and what you feel and all that kind of stuff. And this is, this is great. Like every part of your book just opens up with a really cool, engaging story like, I don't even care if you actually answer the question about like relationships or whatever the, the, the maxim is that you're like, I just want to hear how this works. What, what does the horse really know how all these things? Is it, is it you know, is it a genius? Um, 
So you do, you've done a great job with uh, with just that approach, and so I very, very, very much appreciate that. Well, thank you, man. I, I think that I think we learn a lot from stories, and stories are very engaging. I think often they do get the point across better, and I think they can help to illustrate, you know, the the research. My background was as a screenwriter in Hollywood. It was funny. A lot of other a lot of other nonfiction authors I know. They, they're good with the, the, the research. They're not so good with the stories. Yeah. I think I started out in the reverse situation. I, the, the story part was easy for me and the research was harder. Yeah, you're kind of like the master of the hook. Like every <laughs> section has got that little, like, okay, what's going on here? I want to know more. And then, and then you learn something when you're done reading it and you're like, oh, he got me. Um, <laughs> uh, no, very well done. Um, so we'll kind of fast forward a little bit to the end of the book and just kind of ask, answer this question. Um, are relationships important? Are they really necessary? Because there's a, a lot of guys that have sort of a lone wolf mentality, or they feel like, and I've talked to a lot of guys that are my age and, and guys who are younger that are avoiding marriage and avoiding serious commitments because they've got so much going on in their life that they, they're they distracted by. You know, they can Netflix, they can binge watch, they can play games, they can, you know, uh, lift weights, they can do whatever they want to do. But give us some insight into what you, you know, found in your research. You know, how important are relationships uh, for us uh, in general? Basically, outside of genetics, uh, relationships are probably the most Im- important factor uh, regarding our health, mm. uh, believe it or not. You know, literally, uh, Robin Dunbar is a professor at Oxford, and he said that, you know, he looked at all the research and he said, what will predict whether you will be alive one year after a heart attack. Wow. And he said, basically, whether you smoke and how many friends you have. Yeah, nutrition matters, exercise matters, but they're all relatively small compared to that. And relationships are a huge, huge contributor to our happiness. Basically, having a good social life is the equivalent of an extra $97,000 a year. Mm. You know, go go ask your boss for a $97,000 raise and see how well that goes over. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's, we don't always prioritize them. When we're hungry, we know we need food. When we're tired, we know we need sleep. Sometimes when we're not feeling so hot, when we're a little down, we don't immediately realize that it's the relationships that are missing, the support. It operates at a very, very fundamental level. When people feel lonely, neuroscientists looking at the brain in an MRI, basically When you feel lonely, your brain scans for threats three times as fast. Wow. Because base, and that is not a happy way to go through life. Because basically at a very fundamental level, your brain is saying, if I get into a difficult situation, if I get into danger, help isn't coming. So I need to be on high alert. You're basically on high alert all the time. And loneliness, this is research by John Cacioppo. He's found that basically... The stress increase in feeling lonely is the equivalent of a physical assault. Being lonely is the stress equivalent of getting punched in the face because we just have to operate on high alert because there's no backup. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I thought was interesting in the book is you you, you address this issue of loneliness. And one of the the things that you made, I'll I'll let you clarify this because I'm going to butcher it, but was the that loneliness isn't just the absence of other people around you. That it, there's another state to loneliness, uh, which is um, the absence of meaningful relationships, maybe meaningful dialogue and things like that. Can you can you kind of expound on that a little bit? This is the stuff that really. This is one of the one of the things in the book when I was doing the research that really blew me away. Uh, Faye Alberti, as a historian at the University of York, she looked back through all like tons of ancient texts, old texts, and basically before the 19th century, loneliness didn't seem to exist. That's an exaggeration, but not by much. Basically, the word lonely was used, but it it meant isolated. It didn't have the negative spin, the negative connotation. And that's because before the 19th century, we were all, we didn't have a choice for survival. You were embedded in a nation, a religion, a tribe, a group, a family. It was essential for survival. It It wasn't until the 19th century that we really had the option of living on our own. So loneliness, in terms of not being connected or feeling that connection, really wasn't a problem. You had solitude. Solitude is a positive. But it, was, it wasn't until John Cacioppo's research where he found that basically 
lonely people don't spend, on average, any less time with people than non-lonely people do. Hmm. And this was staggering to me. It sounded ridiculous. But we've all felt lonely in a crowd. Merely having people nearby, if they're not connected to you, being in the middle of Times Square in Manhattan, you don't feel like I'm necessarily a part of something. Yeah. Yet, if you have a good family, solid friendships, you're part of a few groups, you can travel and be away from them. And you don't feel the staggering depths of loneliness because you know they're there. What he realized was that loneliness isn't merely about human beings being nearby. Loneliness is a subjective experience. It's how you feel about your relationships. If you feel connected to your family, connected to your friends, you know they would be there for you. Then you can be apart from them and still feel meaningful connection. But if you don't have good relationships, you can be surrounded by people and still feel isolated. Yeah. Uh, I want to give a call out, too, because you, you mentioned this in your book. Um, oh, I got the book. Uh, Tribe by Sebastian Younger. Yes. He, he mentions this quite a bit, and he kind of dives into this. And so for you guys who are into reading, uh, you know, check out Sebastian Younger's book as well on this, because he, he really dives into how things have changed over the years and, and kind of some what isolation does to people uh, as well. And I, I think one of the kind of talking about loneliness and, and uh, one of the fears that I think a lot of guys have is what happens if I marry a girl and we do kind of fall into this relationship dynamic where like, yeah, we live in the same house, but it's just like my parents, you know, we don't like each other and we're just roommates and, you know, you got to deal with that kind of stuff. But then maybe there's kids involved. And so there's a lot of, uh, I think there's a lot of fear that guys have um, and probably girls as well. I, I'm not a girl, so I don't know, but I talk to guys a lot more, <laughs> but there's a lot of fear that people have in general about this, this notion that I'm going to get into a relationship and then, uh, and then not be able to understand that person, or they're not going to understand me, and I'm going to feel lonely even though I'm basically, you know, uh, living with somebody. And I, I like how your book kind of addresses some of these things and talks about how uh, how common it is actually for people who are married to really not understand each other, like not even understand each other's motives and stuff. Um, yeah, uh, talk a little bit about that because I think that's that's really key because it's not like a hopeless matter. We're like, well, it, it may happen, and you're stuck. But I think, talk a little bit about what you've learned just in, in that uh, and sort of that dynamic, that relational dynamic about people just understanding one another. That was another really big surprise for me was that a lot of people think that, you know, oh, yeah, you start arguing and shouting matches and that leads to divorce. And so fearing that people don't want to communicate as much. You don't want to raise an issue. You don't want to get into it because it's going to turn into a fight. They were going to get divorced. I don't want to get divorced. Mm -hmm. Truth is, shouting matches only lead to divorce. That's 40% of the time. The rest of the time, the, the majority of the time, it's not communicating. It's not talking. John Gottman's the leading researcher on love and marriage. And he actually made a joke. He said, you know, if you've been in a long-term committed relationship and you haven't had a big fight yet, please do that immediately. <laughs> He's like, because basically you need to talk. It's a cliche. But the issue is that... What typically leads to divorce is not that yelling and screaming, because yelling, at least at the end, because yelling and screaming, you only yell and scream when you care. Yeah. And when people start to get to the end of a relationship, they stop caring. They start living parallel lives. That is what more commonly precedes divorce. So exactly what you were talking about, that is actually what leads to divorce is when you feel like we can't communicate, we're just going to live separate lives. And so you really need to talk. You really need to get to know your partner. Gottman goes into this where it's not just an issue of, oh, I know how they like their coffee or I, 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 I know what their favorite TV show is. Pushing a little deeper and asking like the tough questions. How do you define love? How do you define marriage? How do you define a good husband? Yeah. Because that is something that is very idiosyncratic. Those are personal definitions. And their definitions might not be your definitions. And if you don't ask them, you're never going to find out because, again, it's their personal definition. But if you ask and you talk about that, you kind of get the answers to the test. You can kind of say, oh, wait a second. I see taking out the trash as an errand. Mm -hmm. She sees it as a, a signal that he loves me. Yeah. So this is why something that seems so stupid and simple to me leads to these fights is because we define it completely differently and we're not on the same page. 
if you talked about that, you can start to realize, oh, we just have, we assign different values to this. And there may be things that I think are important that she doesn't and things that she thinks are important that I don't. And if you don't talk about that, you'll never know because it's individual. And I think a lot of people miss the opportunity to learn and add definitions to what they actually feel. You know, to, to say, you know, if somebody says, well, you know, why are you getting so upset? So I forgot to take the trash out. No big deal. I'll take it out, you know, in the morning. You know, learning to say uh, that impacts how I think about your affection towards me or love or, you know, those kinds of things, or I don't feel respected or I don't feel valued or I don't feel whatever. Um, there's a, I think there's a, a lot of this has to do with the fact that we don't read as much and, uh, and we don't use the same language and words and concepts that we used to use back in the day. But I think that's one of the things that we've, we've got to take a personal responsibility for is to say, uh, what do I actually feel more than just angry or sad or happy or whatever those kind of really basic things are, yeah. you know, how do I, I got to start putting definitions to, uh, heart level kind of issues, yeah. you know, things that, uh, you know, taking out the trash, you know, it might be something like my dad never took out the trash for my mom and I always thought he was a lazy bastard. And, you know, <laughs> there, there could be something like that, but yeah. we've got to take the time to, to really dig in. My wife and I, we've been going through, um, we did this several years ago, but uh, we did the Myers-Briggs personality test. Okay. And uh, it was really great for both of us because it helped both of us to see each other and go, wait a second, there's a, there's a definition for the kind of person you are. And it's not like you're just crazy, you know, <laughs> like, like, so there are other people like you and, and, you know, um, and you really think this way, like, this is how your brain works. Uh, this is my wife and I are very different personality types and it caused a lot of conflict until we realized like, Oh, we're just wired differently. We see the world differently. And we've had to make that invest investment of time to really accept the fact that the other person, you know, sees something differently. And now we work together. We have a, we own a, we co-own a business, um, uh, selling wedding rings and stuff like that. And so, uh, we will kind of preempt these things with a conversation now. And we'll say, I know you're going to see this differently than I do, but you know, and put it out on the table rather than just throwing it out there and then seeing where it lands, you know, and, and these are all skills that people can develop and, um, and learn how to, even though you may not, you know, increase your accuracy of understanding how the other person thinks, uh, you can certainly increase your awareness that they think differently and, and not be so surprised or caught off, you know, caught off by it. Yeah. Nicholas Apple is a researcher at university of Chicago and he, he found that we're all subject to what's called egocentric anchoring, which is basically we kind of make the default assumption that people think like we do. Yeah. And often that's probably helpful. The issue is he's also looked into how often do we accurately read the thoughts and feelings of others. And it turns out we're terrible with this. You know, basically when we meet strangers, we can only correctly get, get the gist of what they're thinking and feeling 20% of the time. With friends, it hits 30%. With spouses, it hits 35%. 35%. It's yeah. two-thirds of the time. Whatever you think is on your spouse's mind, you're wrong. You know, So if you're not asking questions and asking for clarification, you're probably making bad assumptions. And that's really an issue because it's critical. I mean, again, this sounds cliche. It's critical that you're on the same page. But let me emphasize just how critical that is. Uh, again, John Gottman, the leading marriage researcher, he is able to predict whether a couple will be divorced in five years with over 90% accuracy. Wow. And he does this by asking one simple question. He says, tell me the story of your relationship. Hmm. And again, this is like looking at the data. It's crazy. Over 90% of the time, you can predict divorce in five years just by asking couples to tell their story because that story is so critical. Stories are enormously powerful because if you see marriage as this constant adventure and it's excitement and we're doing great things and we're conquering the world together and she sees it as peace, harmony, relaxation, it's like if you guys don't talk about this and figure out a way to honor both of your values – you're constantly going to be at odds because your vision of what a happy marriage is, is completely different. That doesn't mean you can't be happy, but yeah. if you don't acknowledge it and respect it and say, Hey, we need to have a few evenings that are calm and cool together. So she's getting what she needs and we need to go out this weekend and do something fun so that I feel 
then you can address it. But if that never goes spoke, that never, if that stays unspoken, you're never going to know. And it's constantly going to be at loggerheads and you're not going to know why. A random thought just came to me and I'll jump back into this. Sometimes a rabbit trail. I had no idea Casanova was a real person. And I thought, <laughs> I thought my wife assumed, I, I assumed that she was just as ignorant as I was. I don't know why she's smarter than me, but I said, did you know Casanova was a person? And she's like, Yes. And I said, I always just assumed it was like a character of some kind, you know, because, <laughs> oh, you're quite the Casanova, aren't you? Or something like that. And I thought, that's a real person. So anyhow, that was interesting. Rabbit yeah. trail. So back <laughs> on to it. Uh, you had mentioned um, saying some of the things that we need to say. And one of the quotes in here, and I can't remember if you, if you said this or if it was something that you had heard from somebody else, yeah. uh, but it was great. It says, if it scares you, say it. And this was, you know, in relationship to friendships, but obviously, you know, we want to be friends with our spouses as well. Yeah. If it scares you say it. Why is that so important to, to create like this, um, you know, kind of a cohesiveness and, and a bond between friends? Yeah. Basically like in all our relate relationships, an aspect of vulnerability is really critical and vulnerability doesn't come natural to a lot of guys. Certainly doesn't come natural to me necessarily, but the best way to produce, to get other people to trust you is to trust them and saying, I trust you. That's mm. cheap words. If you tell something about someone something about you that could be used against you, that could make you look bad, you are demonstrating trust in them. You are you are handing them a metaphorical weapon that could be used against you. That is saying uh, that is demonstrating literally. I trust you. Beyond that, you're you. Everybody can see what you're good at, what you're accomplished at, your actions. They don't know what's going on in your head. For somebody to really understand you. You know, they need to know your weaknesses, your difficulties. What are you struggling with? What are you afraid of? That's how people get a really 360 vision of who you are. And more importantly, in a practical way, if you feel like, man, you know, my friends really aren't there for me. You know, my, my spouse really isn't there for me. They really don't help me. Well, if you're not talking about the problems you're having, if you're not talking about your weaknesses, if you're not talking about what scares you, what challenges you, how can that? Yeah. You know, it's like if you're if you're bottling all of that up and again, I understand why that comes natural to guys. But if people don't know what you're dealing with, they can't offer help. They can't offer suggestions. So we need to navigate that. And in terms of where we were talking about earlier with loneliness for to feel like they really understand me. Well, knowing what you're good at, knowing that you're funny or you're charming, that's great. But for somebody to really understand you. For them to say, oh, wow, I know that that situation you just described must be difficult because I know you deal with X. Yeah. That is such a level of deeper understanding where somebody can say, hey, man, I know this is going to be tough for you because, you know, I know you have some issues around X. Like you and I, we're going to work. We're going to work. I'm going to help you out here. That is a level of understanding that is so much more profound. You are going to feel understood. Yeah. You're going to feel like somebody gets you. You're not even going to need to say a word. Those are the deep friendships, the deep relationships. And like you said, you know, the friendship in a marriage, this is, Gottman has said that's the most critical part. And the research consistently shows the most happiness inducing aspect of a marriage is the friendship, mm. you know, and friends make us happier than any other relationship. We really don't get friendship enough respect. And if we want serious, meaningful friendships, we need to talk about the stuff that scares us. And that kind of goes back to this idea that for a guy to say, here's what scares me. Here's, here's what I really feel deep inside. He's got to have some internal knowledge, some insight into his own kind of how he works. Uh, and, and for the guys who are listening to this or watching this, you know, I recommend, yeah, do your personality assessment, figure out your attachment style, uh, do some, you know, kind of map out your own family history and your history of growing up and stuff like that. Get as much insight into yourself as you can. Uh, encourage your wife or your, or your friends, you know, uh, maybe to do the same thing, um, you know, to some degree. So you guys can talk about that. We've got a group of guys that we, that I meet with and, uh, and we all have done our personality types and that kind of stuff and put it on the table just to see, you know, Hey, wh how do you think about things? How do you approach stuff? Not only that, but it also is really helpful to know where their strengths are that yours, where you don't have strength. So I'm an introvert. I got some guys that I know who are extrovert. I'm like, Hey, look, you want to go talk to people? <laughs> <You know? laughs> Does that sound like fun to you? Cool. I'm going to stay at home. Um, so, you know, there's, it's great to kind of know that, but it's also great to know that about your spouse as well. My wife's an extrovert and I'm an introvert 
And I'm like, babe, you know, I like to talk to people for about this much time. You'd like to talk to them for this much time. And, you know, uh, we're both, we both have gifts and strengths, but recognizing those things are really key. Um, but just, I'll give you kind of an example uh, of some insight that I gained a few years back. And this is, this is, this is how subtle it can be sometimes uh, into saying the things that scare us. Um, so my wife and I, we were out driving not far from home and she saw an older guy. He had a sign basically said, Hey, I need help. Need some food. And she said, I really feel like I want to go and, and help this guy, give him some groceries. And I'm kind of like, whatever, you know, like if you want to go ahead, we'll go by the grocery store. You know, I'm thinking scam artist or, you know, who knows what, that's what's going on in my brain. But I'm like, babe, if that's what you want to do, let's go get some groceries for him. So, you know, she did, she went to the store and got some groceries and brought it back. And, um, and the guy had like a legit story or as, as legit, legit a story as I could, you know, you know, uh, so she's helping him load the groceries into the car and I'm kind of seeing her talk to him and, um, and all that kind of stuff, you know, and, uh, and she gets back in the car and what I, what I typically would have said was this, it was really nice what you did for that guy, you know, which would have been, a, which would have been true and something of a compliment to her. But what I was scared to say, and what I actually did say was it really touched me how you showed love to that guy. And so I, I, instead of saying what you did in some kind of external way, people would judge as good. Uh, I said, you made an impact on me and me recognizing that that small of a difference, uh, made a huge, um, it was, it was an eye opener for me just to be able to say that because I was basically saying you have the ability to impact how I feel in pretty significant ways by your actions. And, uh, and for a guy who's got a little bit of lone wolf in him, that's a tough thing to do. And so, but I think we've got to say those things, like you said, say those things that scare us. No, I mean, one of the, I mean, you took something that was, uh, you know, a more generic compliment and mm -hmm. you made it personal. You, 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 you said like to me, this touched me, I felt something. It's like, that makes all the difference in the world. You know, I talk about in the, in the book, you know, Arthur Aaron is a researcher and he was trying to figure out what makes people have deep connections, you know, friendships, love, whatever. And honestly, a big part of it comes down to that opening up, given those personal perspectives, not generic compliments, but like you said, personally, yeah. I felt something. I touched that unique to me just by having people answer a list of questions, you know, you know, that were a little, a little bit more deep, a little bit beyond talking about the weather and politics, you know, like, and it's extraordinarily powerful. He was normally, most of the research shows becoming friends takes dozens or hours, or hundreds of hours. Mm -hmm. Arthur Aaron managed to get people to feel like lifelong friends in 45 minutes by having them ask a series of personal questions. Yeah. And, you know, that was on the friendship level. And the two research assistants that he had working on it actually fell in love and got married. <laughs> You know, <laughs> it's, awesome. it's like, it's, it's pretty crazy, but I think we often don't realize how much that matters, but also how little we do it, how little we talk about those things that matter. And the truth is that, that the studies show small talk in ongoing relationships actually hurts it a little bit. It mm -hmm. lowers the quality of it. And I think we've all felt this where the conversation just kind of goes in circles at a very shallow level versus when you open up and say, you know, like this has been a real issue. This is driving me crazy. You know, that's when we feel like, oh, this person trusts me. They like me. They're opening up. And beyond that, not only does opening up, you know, help the relationship, it also helps our health. Uh, Robert Garfield is a professor at University of Pennsylvania. He found that not opening up prolongs minor illnesses, increases the chance of a first heart attack, and increases the chance that that heart attack will be lethal. We need to have a release valve to be able to talk to somebody about what we're dealing with. And if we don't, you know, again, those stress hormones, it just, it just adds up. It's going to come out in one form or another, and it's better if it comes out through talking. I had a group of guys that I met with um, years and years ago. Uh, it was kind of a church thing. And, uh, it was, this is a very abnormal kind of setting for most guys to be a part of. It was, it was sort of a, um, uh, it wasn't, I wouldn't call it therapy, but basically it was like, you know, five or six guys get together and we're, and, and maybe like each guy has 25 minutes, 30 minutes or something like that to kind of tell his life story. And, um, and the goal was to kind of get to like the gruesome stuff or the gritty stuff or the, the stuff you don't want to tell anybody. Right. And to get it out on the table so we could get some healing for it and, uh, and get some input from it. And, 
you know, a lot of guys had some really, really tough stories. And, uh, but just telling those, uh, you know, this group of guys, some, some, some guys who I'd never seen before didn't know, uh, the bond between us guys. I mean, even today, yeah. just from that, it could have just been that one session. I think we had three sessions, but it could have just been that one session. It was just like, Oh, okay. And I think this comes down to, uh, guys bond where we're doing battle and we, you know, we're not doing battle these days on the battlefield. In most cases, yeah. there's no hordes coming over the wall yeah. and, you know, attacking us. Where we're really doing battle is a is a place that feels very strange to us, and that is within our own minds, within our own homes, uh, battling our own selves, you know, our own discipline issues and things like that, uh, battling trauma and and stuff from the past. And I think whenever we're able to get together and talk about those things, it bonds those guys, allows yeah. some healing to take place, like you said, and uh, and then we can do that obviously in our relationship with our wife uh, as well. So, yeah. Well, you you talked you mentioned Sebastian Younger, who's like written a series of books from you know war to tribe that deal with these issues yeah. and you know it's amazing what he's seen consistently when you consistently hear that a lot of guys who were in combat in active combat getting shot at they miss it mm-hmm. you know and it's not that they miss necessarily being in danger necessarily but that clarity having a group of guys around you I am relying on them. They are relying on me. Mm-hmm. I need them. They need me. I'm willing to sacrifice for them. They're willing to sacrifice for me. What men who go to war, they come back, they realize there's just no equivalent for that. There's in our modern era to be able to have that. I'm relying on you. You're relying on me. It have to be so stark and so clear. So to get that feeling of, Hey, I know you. I trust you. We have to find another way to 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 reach that. And you know, through opening up, we we can get there because the stark clarity of I will die without you, and you will die without me. That's you know, we we don't see that mostly going to the Seven um, Eleven. You know, and so to open up a little bit and to talk about these things to see what guys are struggling with because bullets aren't whizzing by. Yeah. You know, we can we can offer that help. We can offer that support and we can get that feeling of connection that I know this group of guys, this group of people is there for me and they would sacrifice for me. I do need them. They do need me. I make their lives better. They make my life better. We need to find, you know, another way. And, and, and talking can be that way at times. Yeah. And this kind of goes a little bit into the no man is an island uh, piece of the book there. Give us some insights a little bit into kind of what you learned in, in studying that. Because um, I, I think that's, like I said, this is what a lot of guys are dealing with right now. Um, is there any kind of additional stuff that you can think of here, uh, you know, that would, or any insights that popped out to you uh, as you're kind of putting that chapter together? Yeah, it's it's a big shift, kind of kind of parallel with what I was talking about, the difference, the starkness and clarity of war yeah. versus day-to-day life. Today, for most of human existence, we need to be part of a group or we die. The end, period. Now, you can get along pretty well on your own, but we're still missing something, you know? Mm-hmm. And I don't mean that in a very offhand, you know, cheesy kind of way. If, you know, as, as a, to understand as a parent, you know, hey, your kid probably has enough food. Your kid had a shelter, but that doesn't matter. Like, as a parent, you still want to provide them. You still want to make sure they're okay. I, I still want to make sure your kid's fine. They're air conditioned. They're playing Nintendo. It's <laughs> like, no, I want to make sure I want to sacrifice for them. Yeah. And I need that fulfilled. That's part of who I am. That extends out. Obviously, it's most obvious with kids, but that extends out. And the problem is in the past, it was very simple to stay a part of a group because otherwise you're dead. Now we have options. And those options are easier. It's easier to get on Instagram than to get in a car and go see your friend. You know, it's easier to send a text message than to have a phone call and actually talk about what's going on in your life. It's easier, honestly, to watch television than to connect with real people. And this is what Robert Putnam saw. Like, we look back to the 1950s and there were bowling leagues and the Elk Lodge. And there were a lot of groups that, to a lot of people, that just sounds so archaic and dated. Right. Where did that go? Where it went 
Putnam's a researcher at Harvard. What he found is that we developed parasocial relationships. Basically, it was television. Hmm. Television came up in the 1950s, and then through most of the 20th century, we replaced real relationships with these fake relationships. In 2008, there was a writer's strike in Hollywood. Some TV shows stopped producing new episodes. Researchers looked at those people. Basically, it was like they were experiencing a breakup because they (laughs) perceived those characters as real friends. Yeah. And now they're gone. And now we have social media. And I don't want to be somebody who's all social media is evil. But the issue is we only got 24 hours in a day. Some of them are going to be sleeping. Some of them are going to be working. You have a certain amount of budget for social time. If Facebook and Instagram are cannibalizing the time that you would have spent face to face, that you would have spent then, then it's definitely a negative. There are positives to social media. But if it's cannibalizing, if it's replacing those deeper connections, then it can be a problem. And I think the issue is that our defaults have flipped because it's so easy to stay at home. It's so easy to watch TV. And we're picking the easier option. And I think that is difficult. It's also easy, much easier now, to be a little selfish than it was in the past. You know, before, you had to sacrifice, others had to sacrifice for you. And honestly, that feels good. That's called support. Support is always a two-way street. Now... It's easy to stay at home, to not do anything, to not go out. But the problem is we do feel that loneliness. We feel that creeping emptiness. And that's because we don't have the support. And underneath it all, our brains know it. That's why when we're lonely, our brains scan for threats faster because we're not getting what we need. It's like junk food instead of a real meal relationship-wise. It's interesting about the the old lodges and stuff like that because I think back in the day there was this sense that uh, and this is very much true today, by the way, um, but we don't think about it. But it's it, there was this notion of it's who you know. You got to make these connections. You got to get to know these guys. You know, my, my wife watches a lot of British shows and stuff like that, and sometimes I'll watch them with her. Yeah. And I'm like, "Is there a werewolf in this one?" She's like, "No, there's no werewolves." I'm like, ah, dang it. like yeah, it's like it's a perfect setup. Everything's everybody's wearing the right clothes. If there was a werewolf, this would be fantastic. <laughs> but. You know, everybody like wants to be connected with the so and so, and to know this person who you know whatever. Yeah. And the same thing was true here in the, in the, in the states when we had lodges and, and things of that nature. Yeah. It was who you knew, getting connected, being on the bowling league, even. Um, and it was almost like a. Uh, it was seen as something of a necessity that if you wanted to grow in your career, you really had to kind of play the social game to a degree. And like I said, that's still actually true today. There's a very yeah. much a. Um, as who you know, and and those kinds of things. But I think one of the things that I've seen um, is that people's social bandwidth has decreased quite a bit because they do the Facebook, the Twitter, the, you know, Instagram and all of that. They comment on a couple of things. They like a couple of things throughout the day. They, you know, uh, they do that kind of stuff. And it kind of eats into like what we feel like is a, an actual interaction with a human because maybe there is some back and forth, but that becomes our new norm. And so the idea of, you know, actually engaging with people for hours and hours um, and and all that is is something that's becoming foreign to us. And at the same time, I know a lot of guys who are craving that. Even myself, like I, I've joked around as being an introvert, yeah. that is something that we really crave is that deep connection. And we want to get off of the social and get off of the, you know, the videos and all that and just actually sit down eyeball to eyeball, butts in seats, or go out and do something with people yeah. because we miss – uh, missed that social interaction. And, and obviously the pandemic, when that hit and everything got shut down, that really, I think, emphasized our own longing for that and how much we um, how much we really needed that. So when, you know, when things have kind of got lifted, I think people are ready to get out and, and go and do stuff. No, I mean, it's, it's really interesting because I think, I think you're absolutely right. We look at number of Facebook friends, Twitter followers, Instagram followers, and Oh, I'm, I'm doing good relationship wise. And it's like, no, do you feel good? Do you feel connected? Are you staring at the ceiling at 3 a.m. saying, does anybody care about me? You know, it's like that, those, those metrics may not be the, the best ways. And, you know, and we, we need those communities. Mm-hmm. It's, 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 again, easy to say, sounds cliche, but a 2020 research study shows that if you had five, if you have five friends, that's great, wonderful. If you have five friends that all know one another, you are going to feel more supported, yeah. more happiness. Still five friends. But the difference is five friends who know each other becomes a community. Five friends who know each other, they can talk to one another and they can say, 
hey, he's feeling down. Let's do something this weekend. Let's get the group together. Your friends don't know each other. They can't do that. They can't coordinate. They can't organize. There's a synergy that we need from having a group. And we've kind of atomized all this. It's broken into parts. We feel like much like a computer or something else, we can just replace the parts that there's nothing organic to it. Mm -hmm. But there is a synergy to feeling a part of a group, to having those connections that go broader than just one-on-one. So you being a writer, um, you know, we always think about writers. They're like in a shack somewhere or or in like a white house with just like four black squares behind them and, (laughs) you know, living a lonesome life and all that. How has this changed your perspective about what you need to do personally in your own life to be more part of a community and, and connect with more people. I mean, maybe you're super socially out there and connected. I don't know, but has it, you know, has it changed? Like, or, you know, give us some insight into uh, a little bit of that for yourself. It was really ironic when, when I wrote my first book, barking up the wrong tree, the sixth chapter of that book was all about work-life balance. And I was sleeping about five hours a night and driving myself crazy, like a madman trying to get the book finished. Yeah. Quite ironic. And here I am, again, second book, writing a book about relationships, reading the research on the importance of relationships, and I'm in pandemic lockdown, living alone. (laughs) You know, it's just like, oh, my God, like, I'm the worst example of everything I write about. Um, You know, but uh, hopefully I won't write the next book on health, because that that might really kill me. (laughs) But 600 pounds sitting in your room, you know, just, just do everything wrong. I can just hold myself up as the bad example. But seriously. Like, I knew I had a lot to learn from yeah. the beginning. And, you know, but it was valuable to see why I struggled and where I struggled. You know, I'm like you. I'm I'm an introvert, you know, and, you know, it's, it's not my nature, you know. But to maintain the relationships we have, it was staggering to me to see. One study showed that, in over a course of seven years, 50% of close friends will no longer be close friends anymore. Mm. Yeah. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. Yeah. You got seven people who, years ago, yeah. a number of the people you were talking to, you know, you're not talking to them as much. Yep. And those don't always get replaced, you know, so maintenance needs to happen. And I talk about Dale Carnegie, what he got right, what he got wrong. Most of, most of what he said holds up, but he wasn't really focused on, deep relationships and to maintain deep relationships, deep friendships over time. There were two key factors, time and vulnerability. We talked about the vulnerability issue, but the other aspect, which I'm trying to be better about now is time is, is just making the time. Time is scarce. Time is always scarce. Once, especially once you get married, once you have kids, time is really scarce, you know, so it's hard, but the, the positive aspect of that is, when you are busy with your job, with your family, with your kids, with your spouse, if you make time, that sends someone a strong signal, a clear signal, a real signal. I, 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 if I spend an hour a day with somebody, I can only do that for 24 people. That's it. The end. No discussion. Thank you for calling. You know, it's like, that's it. So if you consistently make time for someone, that is a real clear signal. They mean something to you. And if somebody yeah. reciprocates, that's a clear signal. That's how you know friendship is real. They did a study of 8 million, Notre Dame did a study of 8 million phone calls. And what they found is that people who touch base every two weeks, those were the relationships over the course of the study that persisted. Touching base, making the time. Because I'm like all Mr. Absorbed in writing the book, and then I'm absorbed (laughs) in marketing the book. And I got to make the time. You got to make the time because if you don't, you know, we're all busy. So, no, I've tried to be much more deliberate about making the time and opening up a little bit more about what's what's going on inside my head. Yeah, no, that's great. So the guys that um, that I meet with, we have something called a guild, and uh, and we study a book. We actually just finished up Tribe. Okay. Um, so that was my second time reading through that. And it's kind of like a... Um, we put it together as a, as a structured study and stuff like that. But anyhow, we've been to meeting for about a year and a half, maybe almost two years now. Some of the guys are newer in the guild. And uh, a few, let's say probably t- about two months ago, I went and picked up a 1991 Vanagon Westphalia from Utah. Right. And with the plan, I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina. So the plan was to drive it from Utah through Colorado and back down, you know, uh, through Tennessee and all that and get back home. And I got as far as almost Nashville and I started having issues. I mean, it's a 30 something year old car 
And, um, and I'd been having a few issues here and there. And I just got to the place where it's like, it overheated in like a Chick-fil-A parking lot, uh, spewed, or, you know, uh, 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 cooling everywhere and, and just started having all kinds of problems. Starter was acting up. And so anyhow, I'm frustrated. So I call one of my buddies up in the guild and I'm just, uh, he's a mechanic actually, it was a mechanic. And I, and I was asking him questions and he says, look, do you need me to come out and get you? He's like, I'm six and a half hours away. Me and Frank will hop in the, in the truck tomorrow morning. We'll come out there. We'll tow you back. And I was like, I'm going to, I don't, don't want to ask this of anybody. This sounds terrible. And he's like, dude, we will do it. We will absolutely get in the car and come and get you. And, and they did. And so we loaded up and it was a blast. I mean, it was awesome. We, they came and picked me up and we got back about two 30 in the morning, um, Charlotte time. And, uh, but it was great. And that time and that investment and a little bit of vulnerability on my part to say, I, I can't do this on my own. I need help. That, that created a bond between us that, um, that, you know, we didn't have before. And so, like you said, we've got to have, um, one, we've got to invest in those relationships and then we've got to be able to willing to, to put those relationships to the test to a degree yeah. to, to really um, to allow for those times of guys stepping up in each other's lives to be to be a true support and be a true friend. So, you know, 100 uh, percent studies consistently show that we we underestimate on average the amount of assistance people are willing to get. Yeah. You know, we, we, we do. It's like, you know, you look at Ukraine right now. Like the amount of donations, the amount of effort, the sanctions, like people really stepped up. I don't think anybody expected that. You know, it's like consistently we generally don't want to ask people for things. And again, I can understand where that comes from, but it's valuable because then we know who our real friends are. When people who are willing to drive six and a half hours and help you out, you know they care. Because yep. not everybody would do that. That was a powerful signal to them. And, you know, and it, that is going to stick in your memory more than any words oh, yeah. will. And it's like, that's valuable. That's powerful. And it's like, you just got, you just got an answer from the universe. Who really cares about me? <laughs> now you know. Yep. No, that's, that's a great way to put it. Great way to put it. So I figured we'd wrap it up and make sure people actually listen to the end of this, uh, this episode here by talking about sex. Um, so I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll kind of clue them in like, Hey, at the end of the podcast, we talk about sex and that'll keep guys listening. So I don't know if I get points for listening all the way, but you know, uh, so I was going to talk about this from a relationship standpoint. Cause you, you mentioned some stuff that I thought was really cool. It's the stuff that we think about as guys, but we like have some research backing up. It was cool. Was that one sex is important. And two, the, the couples that have the most sex are also the ones that are doing a lot of adventures and, and having fun together being very playful and active and stuff like that. Can you talk a little bit about that activity and that playfulness and, and, and how important that is to the relationship as compared to say, uh, we just have a date night every once in a while and it's kind of like boring and you know, whatever. Yeah. There's a psychological principle called emotional contagion. Basically what it means is whatever environment you're in, you're going to associate the feelings you have in that environment with the people you're with unconsciously. It's not a choice. Well, this can help sustain marriages and can help improve sex. Uh, basically, you know, marriage, love is tricky because love just happens to us. It's passive. Yeah. You just feel it. It's not a choice. You don't choose to fall in love. You just do. And this is a little bit deceptive because as a relationship goes on, entropy kicks in. Like feelings kind of naturally die down a little bit. That doesn't have to be a terrible thing, but you have to be more proactive because those passive feelings of overwhelming love and sanity, they do die down. Mm -hmm. So we need to do something. It can be deceptive. You got to feel like, oh, it's just always going to be like this. It's like, no, we got to, we got to be deliberate. And one of those things is we can leverage emotional contagion. If you just have a date nights where it's Netflix and pizza again, that's not very stimulating. In fact, it's a little boring and you're going to associate those boring feelings with your partner. Oh yeah. As opposed to, if you're going out, you're doing exciting, fun stuff. You are going to feel a fun, exciting connection to your partner. They did a study and they split couples into two cohorts. The first one had pleasant dates, and the second one had exciting dates. Like we're going to go skiing, we're going to go to concerts, we're going to go horseback riding. Yeah. Exciting one hands down. And at the end of that weekend, those couples were notably double digit percentage more likely 
to have sex, to have fun, to be happy. They did another study where they literally Velcro strapped two couple, like couples together and made them run an obstacle course. <laughs> Relationship satisfaction went up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they said adrenaline makes the heart grow fonder. That fun, that stimulation. A lot of people think like, oh, in the beginning of the relationship, we were in love. So we did a lot of fun stuff. That's true. But it also goes the other direction. Yeah. You did a lot of fun stuff. So you fell in love. So to sustain love, sex, connection, all of that, you need to go do exciting, fun things. Like this is really important because otherwise your life's going to feel boring, your partner's going to feel boring, and you're going to be boring. So as long as we keep saying, what's something exciting, something fun, something gets the adrenaline going, doing that with your partner is a really powerful way to sustain those feelings over the course of a long-term relationship. And, and I get it from a lot of guys' perspectives and, and even uh, wives' perspectives is that they, at the end of the week, they're tired. They just want to chill. They don't want to go out. They don't want to do anything. They've been doing all that kind of stuff. And here's what I would say. Plan it out in advance. Go ahead and buy the tickets or set, you know, get the flight, you know, scheduled. Decide where you're going to go, what you're going to do, and make your life an adventure. If you're just waiting for that to show up, like maybe when we have a free weekend, we'll go skiing and veil or something. I don't know what people do, but you know, <laughs> you know, it's probably not going to happen. You, you really have got to be intentional and, and plan those things out because it makes a, it does make a huge difference. My wife and I, we've been married for 26 years now. Wow. And, um, so we got married when we were 18 years old and uh, almost didn't make it several times, but we have made it. And one of the things that we found is that we both love to travel. We love to eat and, uh, and we're pretty good travel companions. And so that's something we didn't do when we had kids young and all that. But that's something now that every year we plan out, like, where are we going to go? What's the adventure going to be? Yeah. Um, you know, and that kind of stuff. And so, um, yeah, absolutely key. And there's always more sex, you know, when all that <laughs> stuff happens. So, which is good, good as well. So, well, Eric, you've got a, uh, speaking of Instagrams and, and followings and stuff like that, um, you've got a really fun Instagram. Uh, Thank you profile. I always love seeing it. It's always something witty and winsome and fun. Even if it's not from you directly, yeah, it's yeah. still something that you you curated for us. And I'm like, oh, this is always this always a good one. Um, so uh, people can find you on Instagram and over on your website. Give us the uh, the address, but we'll yeah, make sure the, we link to it. If they, if they go to ericbarker.org, E-R-I-C-B-A-R-K-E-R.org, that'll redirect them. My URL is tricky for most people to pronounce and spell. Yeah. So yeah. ericbarker.org will get them there. All right, cool. That sounds great. And uh, also, last thing here, um, it looks like you've got great beard potential. And I'm just saying, <laughs> you know, I'm thinking the writer, uh, big, big flowing beard. You're going to sell twice as many books if you grow that sucker out. I just, that's what I think is going to happen. A pipe. I mean, I, I, the, the, the pipe would definitely be very writerly. I'm going to, I'm going to, and, and then if you get the pipe, then, then the smoking jacket with the patches makes sense. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. You should get a patch for all your like accolades for writing books and stuff like that. And just humbly yeah. wear that everywhere you go, smoking a pipe. I, 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 if I ever left the house, it would definitely make a difference. <laughs> <laughs> well, look. So I, 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 would have to, I would have to look into the, 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 the beard issue. and Maybe an eye patch. That would be another good patch. Oh, that would be sweet. Yeah. Oh, you'd definitely sell some books that way. Yeah, no, no doubt, man. Um, well, look, man, I appreciate this book. I, I love your writing style once again. And thank, thank you for you. digging in all, all of this stuff and, and helping to educate us. I appreciate your time being here on the podcast. And I look forward to uh, just keeping in touch with you. Thanks so much, man. I appreciate it. Well, there you have it, men. I'd love to know what you thought about the episode. Feel free to reach out to me on any of my social media networks. And look, if you got something out of this, Make sure another guy does too. Share the episode and make sure it gets in front of the guys that need to hear it the most. Until next time, keep your powder dry and may a fair wind be always in your sails. <laughs>